Hello and welcome to the journal webinar series of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. This, this series features the latest research published in our society journals. I'm Liz Gebhardt with Crop Science. Thank you for joining us today for use of unoccupied aerial systems in plant breeding. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that questions can be en entered in the Q&A section and the moderator will address them at the end of the presentation. The webinar will be recorded and the recording will be emailed to all attendees after the session. Now I'm happy to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Dr. William Scapeau. Dr. Scapeau is a professor and soybean breeder in the Kansas State University Department of Agronomy. His research focuses on soybean cultivar development with the goals of improving seed yield, genetic diversity, and abiotic stress. He's currently a technical editor for Crop Science. Bill, I'll hand things over to you. Okay, thank you. And thank you all for taking the time to join us today. As Liz uh, mentioned, please enter questions in the question and answer sec section, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Aaron Carter. Dr. Carter is an O is the OA Vogel Endowed Chair and Winter Wheat Breeder at Washington State University, where he started in 2009. His program focuses on development of winter wheat cultivars with stable and high grain yield across environments, tolerance to biotic and abiotic stresses, and high end use quality. He uses a variety of breeding tools, such as genomic selection and high throughput phenotyping to improve the selection efficiency of the program. Today, Dr. Carter will speak about high throughput phenotyping with unoccupied aerial systems as a promising tool for plant breeders and researchers. His report on this topic was published in the July 2023 issue of Crop Science. Dr. Carter, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Bill. Make sure. All right, so yeah, um, thank you. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Dr. Aaron Carter. I'm from Washington State University, and I will be presenting on behalf of um, all my co-authors on this manuscript who are listed here on this first slide. So I want to give uh, acknowledgement to them. Um, so I'm at Washington State University, along with Dr. Sankaran, who's a, a sensor and drone expert. And then we also teamed up for this review with uh, Iowa State University and Dr. Singh in the soybean breeding program there, and with Texas A&M and Dr. Murray and his group there in maize breeding, and then Dr. Patterson at the University of Georgia in cotton breeding. Um, so this was kind of the team that we put together to to review and discuss how we're using uh, unoccupied aerial systems in plant breeding. And um, we would like to thank the Crop Science Society of America for inviting us to this webinar uh, to be able to present our, our research and how we're using uh, these systems in plant breeding. So here's just uh, the, the paper uh, for your information. Uh, but we would also uh, like to thank uh, the editor of Crop Science, Dr. Paul Scott, who uh, invited us to, to write this review and encouraged us to put this together. So uh, thank you to the journal. And then also would like to recognize all of the funding that was associated with this research, uh, multiple grants from uh, USDA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, um, some National Science Foundation grants, and then many uh, grants from local commodity boards and universities as well. So a lot of effort went into uh, this research and, and developing uh, these different phenotyping systems in our different breeding programs. So just start off with a brief introduction. Uh, the past 20 years has really seen a significant increase in the use of these aerial systems and small plot research trials. And as we went back and looked at these, uh, a lot of it just started off with uh, visible light or RGB images. And over 60% of those were analyzed with just a simple linear regression. So it really started off kind of on the, the basic sense, which is really to be expected. Uh, here's just uh, some, some citation and publication trends that we've seen over the past uh, 20 years. 
uh, whether that's uh, you know searching high throughput phenotyping in plant breeding, phenomics, or UAV, UAS drone and crop imaging. Um, so you can really see it's it's grown uh, in the recent years, which indicates there's a lot of groups that are interested in this technology, a lot of groups that are using it and and interested in how it could benefit their programs as well. Um, and as as time has progressed, and I think as different companies have seen this interest, the sensors are becoming more advanced and more affordable. Um, so we have uh, multiple, instead of just RGB now, we have multi-spectral, multi-spectr hyperspectral, LIDAR, thermal, um, various other sensors from multiple different companies. Um, the analysis is also expanding. We're seeing a lot more analysis going into machine and deep learning and artificial intelligence approaches. Um, and then we're also seeing a lot more commercial and open source data processing tools uh, just to be able to analyze the images uh, that are available for general use, which is which has been very helpful. So this has really allowed different pr programs to uh, explore more deeply how we can use these systems and become more affordable as well. And the reason a lot of plant breeding programs are looking at the use of high throughput phenotyping um, and UAS in their systems is really has to do with this breeder's equation. Um, so this has to do with uh, looking at genetic gain over time. So we want to increase the genetic gain for the different traits that we have to be able to increase that. So if that's like final grain yield, we want to see final grain yield increasing over time. And we want that increase to be as uh, strong as possible. And so we do that either with uh, increasing selection intensity, which means growing more plants, uh, increasing selection accuracy, which means being able to measure plants better, uh, increasing additive genetic variance, which means using more genetic diversity in the in the crosses and the plants that we look at, or being able to uh, decrease the years per breeding cycle, or that really translates into being able to create more seasons per year. Um, and all of those will increase our rate of genetic gain. So when we look at high throughput field phenotyping with this, uh, we've kind of broken it down in, in the review article into three different sections. Uh, the first is to automate routine measurements. Um, and this will kind of be an outline of what I go through in, in the talk today. Um, so by, by automating these routine measurements, we're getting at this growing more plants and being able to measure plants better. Um, along with that, we want to find new signatures of eliteness or new traits that we can look at that we haven't been able to look at previously that we think will be able to uh, help develop plants better. And again, allows us to grow more plants and evaluate those plants uh, more efficiently. And then the last is the application of uh, phenotyping. Uh, so one is looking at phenomic selection. And by being able to look at phenomic selection, this is where we can use more genetic diversity, make more uh, wide crosses, and be able to uh, create more seasons per year as well. Um, and then it also allows us to identify new, new stress signatures for management on farmers fields, new phenotypes and mechanisms of biological importance. So a lot of different applications that we'll talk about. Um, and then advancements have also been made in removing uh, UAS processing bottlenecks. Um, you know, a lot of this has to go back to uh, taking this data and how fast can we get this data back. So when I when I first started looking at this, um, you know, if I was going out and maybe rating plant emergence, while it might take me six hours in the field to walk through and evaluate that, uh, when I got back to the office, <clears throat> I had all the data. Um, whereas if when we initially started, if we flew the drone, although it may only took uh, 15 minutes to collect that data, it then took two months on the back end to get that data back to me. Um, and so there's a lot of work that has been done in removing that processing bottleneck so that not only does it take uh, less time to collect the data in the field, but then also less time to get that back into the hands of the plant breeder. And this really takes a a large transdisciplinary team to do that. Uh, we were working a lot with engineers and computer scientists and 
uh, bioinformaticians to figure out how to analyze all that data very quickly. But when we look at this, really the adoption of uh, this technology in plant breeding programs is still tied to genetic gain. If we can't see uh, increase in genetic gain and the value in that, or at least a perceived value, it's gonna be very hard to adopt that. Um, there's still the cost and returns. So, uh, you know, what does it cost to fly the drone and collect that data versus what we're getting um, on the back end or the value back to the program? And then, of course, the breeder's comfort with the technology. Um, and then further adoption is relying on some uh, specific uh, information. So uh, one of those is evidence of human bias. Um, if we see that when we're collecting data, there's a lot of bias on the human side um, and being able to use a, a, a drone or a UAS um, that removes that bias, that might be beneficial. I mentioned already the, the tie to genetic gain. Um, and then I think also as the continued cost of UAS data collection decreases, we'll see more adoption of this as well. So I just wanted to now go into these three, uh, these three topics that we talked about on phenotyping routine traits and previously infeasible traits, and then uh, UAS application and breeding programs. Uh, so really, when we look at the routine traits, we're asking the question, can we take traits that are typically collected in a breeding program and make them more efficient or more accurate to collect? Uh, so when we look at something like plant height, um, you know, it's very easy to go out and, and put a ruler in the, the ground and measure plant height uh, very directly. And, you know, many times a drone can do this more efficiently for us in shorter amount of time. And then when we look at other things like grain yield, uh, that might be more of an indirect selection. Can we use a trait like NDVI or another spectral indice and be able to evaluate yield indirectly based on that um, more efficiently than we can with, with a combine or with measuring yield per se? And so when we look at the four different breeding programs, um, and this is what I constantly see when I'm talking with, with breeding programs is every program is going to have different traits that they're interested in, different traits that are routine for them. Um, so this just lists a few of those that uh, the, the different programs have converted over um, to use UAS instead of uh, manually phenotyping these routine traits. And then also here's a Here's a little slide from the soybean breeding program about how they've actually put this into application. Uh, so this for them is uh, looking at um, maturity and relative maturity on soybean, which is a very important trait to put them into different uh, groupings. And so they were able to take uh, eight time points uh, over the growing season of the uh, soybean plant and develop the pipeline to automate these maturity ratings. And I think down here, this impact really explains uh, why we're converting some of these routine traits. So this is something that, that has to be done and was very routine in the, the program. It took them about one month to complete with uh, multiple people out there rating. Um, and now it can be completed in eight hours uh, with the drone and the data analysis on the backside, which really reduces uh, the variability optimizes time and resources and, and allows their program to work on other traits instead of just looking at uh, maturity. So a, a very good application of, of what we're trying to do with UAS in the breeding programs. Um, and then also looking at these previously infeasible traits. So really asking the question, what new, what new traits can we look at that will be beneficial to the breeding program? Um, and so here's an example of the maize breeding program also looking at senescence, but previously for them, this was a, a infeasible trait, very difficult to measure, um, but using the same time series like the soybean breeding program, they're now, now able to get that information into their program. And again, looking at the various different uh, crops, uh, each crop and each breeding program is looking at different um, traits, uh, a lot of it is now going to those difficult traits like yield-related traits, uh, water status, plant growth, 
uh, canopy temperature, um, a lot of traits that were just very difficult to measure. Um, I always joke around, right? As a plant breeder, we can only measure what our eye is able to see and sensors and uh, aerial systems now allow us to measure a lot of things that our, our eye is not able to visibly look at. Something like this where we're looking at uh, water stress um, in the plots and uh, canopy temperature. Um, here's an example of drought stress in uh, soybean as well. That we, you know, it was very difficult to measure previously and, and now we're able to get a, a sense of it and this image uh, shows that very well on how we're able to do that. And then moving a little bit on to uh, UAS applications as well. Um, so this is a figure from uh, the review article uh, from the maize breeding program, really looking at uh, temporal predictions in the breeding program and genotype by fly and genotype by environment interactions. So the maize breeding program really has found value in being able to combine uh, multiple flights throughout the year into uh, one prediction uh, estimation. Um, so it, it's uh, very similar to like you would be using genomic selection where you would be using all the genotypic information that you had on a, a plant and then the thousands of plants you have in the breeding program to estimate uh, breeding values based on the genetics of the plants. So this is the same uh, theory of that, but now we're using all of the uh, phenotypic and phenomic information uh, across time. So it's not just looking at one time point and adding in that one time point for selection, but really starting from planting um, and using the drone or a UAS to evaluate the crop constantly throughout the growing season and then building these prediction models around that um, to estimate instead of genotypically estimated breeding values, now we're, we're estimating phenotypically uh, estimated breeding values. And so it's kind of the same theory where we can evaluate uh, the performance of lines in environment A and then using this uh, phenomic prediction, be able to estimate how their performance will be in environment B or in an untested environment. Um, and with this, we're seeing also a lot of genotype by fly and genotype by environment interactions that we can pull out as well. So I think it's been a, a very uh, valuable and powerful application of UAS in the breeding program. And like I say, specifically in the maize breeding program, um, as we put this review together, this was something we also found that all of these techniques and, and technology aren't uh, equally beneficial in um, every program. So where this temporal prediction might be beneficial in, in the maize breeding program, uh, in particular in my wheat breeding program, we're still evaluating to see if that is, is the case also, or if these more standard time points uh, are going to be more beneficial for us. So. So there's still a lot to, to learn and go through um, as we use this technology. Um, the other thing uh, we've used this for is spatial adjustments. So this is one of my breeding uh, locations and breeding plots here. We see the three different replications here. And when you look at it just uh, on the visual with RGB, nothing really looks out of place. Everything looks fine. Uh, but then when we look at it with the water index, we see that this first replicate was really under some water stress, whereas the other two replicates were not. And so this has allowed us to uh, do some additional spatial adjustment in that first replicate to get a better estimation of, of final grain yield um, using some of this spectral data um, to adjust those, those final grain yield numbers. Um, and then a lot of programs are, are using this for uh, indirect selection and selection indices. Uh, this is a figure from the paper from the soybean breeding program, uh, where again, they're looking at different traits at different time points, not really using this yet in that temporal sense like the maize program was, 
but being able to go out and early on look at emergence and plant stand, be able to make selections based on that, and then canopy traits, plant stress, maturity, and so on, uh, using various different sensors. Um, and then really trying to combine this in with uh, uh, phenotypic selection, genomic selection, and phenomic selection all together, um, which we think is, is going to be a, a very powerful way to make selections in the breeding program with, with this technology. Uh, here's a, an example of how we use it in uh, my wheat breeding program here at Washington State University. Uh, so we do rapid uh, inbred line development and our first generation out in the field. Uh, we use genomic selection to make a lot of uh, decisions. And then as we move into full yield plots, that's where we're combining uh, continued genomic selection, but then also adding the uh, image data into our selection pipeline um, to begin to make selections as we go throughout the breeding program and eventually to variety release. Uh, so these are grown at multiple locations. So we're able to see a lot of different uh, uh, location uh, estimations and then make selections based on those different environments as we move forward across years. So uh, really combining all the data together across years and across locations to be able to find varieties that perform stably across all of those. Uh, here's just a, a project we've been working on kind of outside of, of this review paper, but I think really shows where we're heading in, in this idea of combining these different spectral indices with genomic prediction. Um, so the control over here in prediction is just our, our normal uh, genomic prediction for grain yield. And you see when we put it in application, we actually give very low prediction accuracy for grain yield. Uh, but when we take, in this case, we add uh, data from 2018 to 2021 at eight different locations. So over 5,000 unique uh, genotypes that we had spectral data on. And then in 2022, we were able to make predictions using all this previous data for grain yield. And we see with uh, different estimations of either percent canopy or NDVI, NDRE, NWI, or some of these in combination, uh, this GBLUP model here is really able to increase um, our selection accuracy and prediction accuracy for overall grain yield. And we, we think this not only improves grain yield, but since we're using so many years and so many locations of data, we're also selecting varieties that are going to be very stable for that trait um, grain yield across these different years and environments. So just kind of looking at what the what this all costs to get started, I know that's always a question um, and it really varies. So when we look at drones, um, you know, they can be $3,000 over $30,000. Um, I put here, this is what our drone costs is about $4,000. And that's by the time you buy the drone and a case and some extra batteries associated with it to, to fly, uh, to increase your flight time. Um, the cameras and sensors also have a very wide range. If you're looking at just simple RGB cameras, those are fairly inexpensive. Once you start getting up into uh, multi-spectral -spectr or hyperspectral, uh, more expensive. Um, the camera that we use, which is a six-band multi-spectral, was about $15,000. So that's really where the, the bulk of the expense can come if you are really going up in, in sensors and wanting to look at multi- or hyperspectral sensors. Um, another important thing are calibration panels. Uh, these are a must for radi radiometric calibration. Um, costs about $1,000 a panel. And in some of the work that's been done by uh, Dr. Sankaran here at Washington State University, uh, the set of three panels is really what's needed for, for accurate um, calibration of your uh, sensor data. Uh, so right there, you know, it's a, it's a pretty expensive uh, effort just to get started. And then on top of that, you need the additional personnel to uh, run this. Um, some programs are using graduate students to, to assist with that. Others have full or part-time technicians. Um, different groups have collaborating departments that 
the fly the drones um, or you can actually now hire services out that will come and and do the uh, the image capture for you so that's going to vary greatly um, but as what well, I think every program has found is you do have to have someone dedicated um, to collecting the data analyzing the data um, otherwise you just can't do it in an accurate and time to get it back to make selections by the end of the year and then just some other considerations uh, that are fairly low cost but uh, making sure you have ground control points uh, different drone accessory. There's landing pads that you can buy to put on the ground to to land your drone on, and and various other things that are are needed to make things go a little bit easier. But like I say, are fairly inexpensive in themselves. So, um, so yeah, you know, about about twenty five thousand dollars in just uh, cost to get started, and then along with the personnel. So then looking at some of the limitations that we've found um, and just considerations for you if you're thinking about uh, going and, and using uh, these aerial systems. So this is a, a map of the state of Washington and it's a rainfall map. So the more red is only about um, 12 centimeters of, of precipitation. And then as we get up into the purple, you know, we're up over uh, 100 centimeters of, of precipitation. Here in blue is where I'm located at Washington State University in Pullman and then all of these black dots are locations that we uh, go and fly. So we're really limited by geographic location. Our farthest uh, location is about a four hour drive away um, and so as you start thinking about how do we get to all these locations and fly them all in a timely manner and then you're also limited by weather and time of day. So you should be flying uh, close to solar noon, uh, cloud cover is bad, high winds are bad. Um, and so it just becomes uh, a logistical um, adjustment of how you can get to all these locations when they need to be flown at the appropriate time. Um, also, as I mentioned previously, the different pipelines for data processing is a limitation. Uh, these again are improving. So this is a pipeline that we use where we've got some manual control over what's going on, but then also with uh, the R software package, we're able to automate uh, a lot of it on the back end that's able to, to speed up the data um, collection and getting the data to me in a timely manner. And then also just data quality, as with everything, uh, ensuring good data quality with radiometric corrections with the, the calibration panels is essential um, to really make good predictions. And then looking uh, at some additional considerations really on phenomic and genomic selection, something that a lot of programs have looked at is what is more valuable or what gets the higher prediction accuracies, either genomic selection or phenomic selection. And previously, a lot of breeding programs were looking at genomic selection because at the time it was the uh, it was cheaper to get the genomic information, uh, and it seemed to be something that was going to be useful. But I think now, as time has gone, um, and we put genomic selection into practice, we're seeing that genomic selection in addition to phenomic selection and sometimes phenomic selection alone has actually been able to give us the higher prediction accuracy. So I really think moving into uh, this image analysis and being able to collect data over time and years in a breeding program and starting to add phenomic selection in with the genomic selection approach, at least for me, as you saw in that previous slide, has really increased prediction accuracy and is definitely the way our program is going in the future. Um, and then also just the, there's a transition from research to application. Um, so even, even within my own breeding program, I breed both soft white and hard red winter wheat. Um, and we found that there's different spectral signatures that are important in the hard wheat versus the soft wheat. So it takes a while to understand the images that you're getting and doing a little bit of background research on that really before you can put it into full application in your program um, and it's even hard to look at other programs in other states or other parts of the world and 
do exactly what they're doing and have it fit perfectly for your program. Like I say, even within my own market class was different. And so as I start talking to other programs uh, across the globe, uh, they're going to be a little different from how we use um, aerial systems in our program and what spectral signatures are most important for us to another program. And so there is a couple of years of just collecting data, analyzing it, learning uh, what's going to be most important for you and your breeding program. Uh, but definitely being able to talk to other programs and understand what they're doing and how they're doing it gets you um, a lot of that background research out of the way. And then it's just fine tuning for what you need in your own individual program. And I always like to end with this uh, slide here. Um, I always like to joke with my graduate students, this is what plant breeding looks like in the 21st century, where previously it was me walking through the field and spending hours walking around. Now it's my graduate students out there looking up at the sky or down at the control box, uh, flying the drones, collecting data, and then analyzing that back in the office. Although I, I always joke around with this, um, I really think it is where uh, the, the future of plant breeding is heading. I don't think that eliminates the value of walking through the field and physically looking at plants and understanding what's going on with, with your visible eye, but the added information we can get from uh, these aerial systems on traits that are very difficult for us to see um, with our eyes are very difficult for us to collect in a, in a timely manner. Um, that added value and that added information especially as we start looking forward and looking at new uh, biological processes, when we start looking at photosynthesis and how well plants photosynthesize and, and stomatal conductance, um, sensors are probably the only way we're going to be able to look at some of those traits. So um, I really think it's, it's going to be a big part of, of plant breeding in the 21st century. So with that, uh, again, on behalf of my co-authors on this paper, I'd like to thank you for, for attending today. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions right now. You see my email address there. Uh, but also, if you have questions for, um, you know, maybe specific questions for any of the other breeding programs, soybean, maize, or cotton breeding programs, you can email me and I'd be happy to get get you their information or you can also look at the paper um, and and look up those different uh, authors and email them directly as well. So with that, I will be happy to answer any questions, Bill. Okay, good, very good. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Crocker. Uh, excellent presentation. And indeed the questions are coming in, so let's, uh, <laughs> Let's see what we can do here about it. Uh, uh, so one question: uh, What what drone? What what drones? Uh, what sensors are you using in your program? Yeah, so my program in particular, I use the uh, DJI Inspire drone, and then I use a sensor from Centera that is a multi-spectral sensor. Um, it's got six different bands associated with it, and we you're able to. Um, specify what what bands you want in that camera and so based on the work we've done we we knew we wanted to be able to calculate things like ndvi and uh, normalized water index and ndre so we we were able to special order that camera with those specific bands to allow for that calibration but there's when you go to uh when you go to the review paper um, we list a lot of different companies who, who offer drones, who offer uh, software for data analysis, um, sensors. So, you know, there's, there's multiple options out there. Those are just the ones I use, but uh, there's really multiple options out there that have different price points, um, different uh, levels of uh, precision. Um, different megapixels on their camera, you know, it, it's everything. So really it's just, uh, you know, talking with other people maybe who use them or doing a little bit of internet search to, to see what might work for your program. Okay, okay, thank you. So you mentioned water index and one of the question is, uh, how is that index calculated? Is it from hyperspectral images or uh, what are the formulas used to, to uh, measure that? 
Yeah, so normalized water index uses the 900 and 970 nanometer uh, reflectance, um, and and that that's what goes into the the uh, calculation of that. So we're starting to get up into the uh, uh, NIR uh, range um, outside of the visible range when we get up to you know that that wavelength. Um, Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. So uh, another thing that you mentioned, the calibration panel. What is that? And how is that, is that used? Yeah. So the calibration panel, um, they're panels that have been developed to uh, provide a known uh, reflectance of sunlight. Um, and so when, when you, you put them down at the field that you're flying, You'll fly your drone across that or whatever system you're using, making sure that you capture uh, the reflectance of those calibration panels as well. Um, and then you use the the reflectance of those calibration panels to adjust uh, the, the sensor data that you get. Um, because although we may see that it's a, a clear day, at least clear to our eyes, um, in the upper atmosphere, there may still be um, clouds or or other things that get in the way of of the full uh radiation and sunlight coming through the atmosphere so you're able to to adjust for that um, on any given day using those calibration panels um, and so that's really a key to getting good sensor data um, is making sure that you have those reflectance panels on the ground and they're just i can't remember they're about uh, a meter by meter square, maybe a little smaller, um, and th that you you put out and and are just able to, like I say, kind of that's kind of your control for the the sunlight that's coming in through the atmosphere, so you can adjust the sensor data. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, with all the work that you've been doing with this and cooperators and so on, what's what's something that you've been very surprised about uh, with this technology and methodology? Oh man, I think every day we're surprised with something different. Um, you know, I, I think the the biggest thing is, you know, the the length of time it does take to analyze the data and and get a good pipeline going. Um, you know, it took us it took us a good good number of years uh, working with various uh, other disciplines really to find a pipeline that we were able to analyze the the data um, quickly. Um, now that's changed. So I've started. I started ten years ago uh, collecting, um, you know, sensor data, and so uh, we didn't have a lot of the the software and the open source software that we have now. Um, so I, I think that's not quite as big of a limitation. But it was something that was very surprising um, when I started. Um, and then the other thing that's really been surprising is indeed how well this has been able to uh, increase our prediction accuracy. Um, so, you know, when we started using genomic selection, um, theoretically, it showed high prediction accuracy, but when we actually started implementing it into the program, it was only down to about 20% accuracy for, for these difficult traits like grain yield and, and such. So the, the spectral data has really been able to uh, capture what's going on in the plant to provide a high prediction accuracy for grain yield um, that our genomic prediction wasn't able to do. Um, so that, that's been surprising and very exciting as well, because um, I think that's what's going to be needed to continue to push uh, traits like grain yield forward, because we're able to now, I think, understand some of these biological processes that we couldn't previously, but sensor data is now starting to open that up and understand. Okay. okay, very good. Thank you. Here's another one. Um, how does your breeding program handle data management, uh, data sharing, and after public uh, publication or variety release, make the data publicly available? Yeah, um, so we have, uh, yeah, it's been hard managing all the data. Um, so I, personally, in my program, I manage a lot of that uh, through graduate students. So the graduate student research projects revolve around using uh, 
image data. Um, so they manage a lot of that data. Um, you know, they, they store it. We have databases in-house so we can store that on and, and keep it organized. Um, so as far as, you know, when it goes to when we, when we release a variety and, and share it, um, you know, a lot of that hasn't been shared on particular varieties per se, because, you know, it's all the data that's going into making those selections. Um, we're, we're happy to share uh, data with, with other groups. Um, you know, we've been working with some researchers at CIMIT recently um, and, and been providing them our data so they can they can do some different analyses with that um, so we're happy to share it we are um, beginning to share some of it on the wheat side anyway um, on the t3 database which is a, a publicly available database um, we're just starting now to, to upload all that data there um, and start making it available um, for for our breeding trials with spectral data with genomic data there um, just given the given the large amount of data that we have, it's taken us a while to compile it and get it to a point where it's shareable and understandable. Um, but but we're working towards that on that T3 database. Okay, good. There are several questions that are related to you know have you used uh, the UAVs for X, Y, and Z, such as uh, nutrient composition, uh, off types. Uh, uh, characterizing off types, um, uh, foliar diseases in wheat um, uh, or in the heads of wheat, uh, the leaves are in the heads. Have you, have you worked on those types of phenotypes? Yeah. Um, uh, on those in particular, I have not, but there are a lot of programs that are doing that. Um, like I say, sometimes it comes back to um, when you look at the different traits as I mentioned in the presentation, it's where do you find the value? Um, so for certain things, for some of our foliar diseases, they're highly heritable, meaning they're controlled controlled by genetics very strongly. Um, I do a very good job of, of reading and, and understanding the data just visually. It doesn't take me that long to walk through and do a very good job um, looking at that. So it hasn't been a priority for me to look at like foliar diseases. Um, I know though there are a lot of programs, I think I just saw a paper come out recently that was using uh, drones to look at fusarium head blight, which is a head disease in wheat. Um, I know there's a lot of other crops and other programs who are using it um, for disease. Uh, so like I say, in, in mine in itself, we don't use it, but it's definitely usable. Um, there are programs that are using it for off types as well. Um, I've seen a couple of research papers that are actually using it to try and quantify uh, weed pressure and how many weeds are in the field. So kind of being able to say what weeds are there, even what different species of weeds um, and how much uh, pressure there might be. So this expands far beyond even just breeding programs. Um, so the weed science programs could use it for, you know, efficacy of different herbicides they're testing, um, as was mentioned in the question, different, you know, nitrogen status. So, you know, it could be an agronomist or a soil scientist that is using this to estimate. Um, there are, so like the cotton breeding program, they are looking at it for uh, nitrogen status, um, nitrogen use efficiency. Um, so, yeah, it's all, I, I, when I first started, I, I kind of joked around. And I said, really, the use of drones is going to be limited by your imagination. I think drones are able to capture a lot of this. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are going to take a little extra research to understand what it's telling you. Uh, but you can really use it for a lot of different applications um, uh, across numerous traits. And again, it really goes back to uh, the value that you see in your own program. So for me in particular, Foliar diseases is not a high priority because I do that fairly well myself. Um, and so I'm going to use my drone capabilities for those more difficult traits. But if, you know, fusarium head blight in wheat was your number one issue and it's hard to rate, it's going to be absolutely a great tool for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. While you're making making those comments, uh, another trait came in, canopy temperature. Have you worked with canopy temperature at all? 
Yeah, we worked with canopy temperature. Uh, initially, we worked with handheld sensors, um, but now there's some some very good uh, thermal sensors that you can put on on uh, aerial systems as well. Um, and yeah, there there's going to be a lot of value, I think, also with uh, thermal data and being able to understand uh, water use and water use efficiency in plants with that thermal data. Okay. Uh, good, thank you. Um, another good question here. You know, how is your your image data, uh, what spectral data, or whatever? How well is that predicting yield for you? Yeah. So um, that slide that I showed uh, previously with the bar graphs, um, that was for yield data, and so the the phenomic data uh, was able to predict about 60% um, with 60% accuracy grain yield. Um, now, you know, that might seem, that might seem kind of low. Um, I mean, it's higher than usually what we do without that, and it's higher than genomic prediction alone. But as what we've found is that's just in one given year. But as we've started combining multiple years and multiple locations together, so that rainfall map of Washington, we grow wheat anywhere from, um, what about 150 millimeters of annual precipitation all the way up to 500 millimeters of annual precipitation and then we also have a very strong um, north south uh, difference as well where we get anywhere from zero days of snow cover to over 150 days of snow cover so because of that wide variation in growing environments as we've been able to use the spectral data across multiple locations and multiple years, we're starting to find varieties that now have a more stable yield across environments. So previously one environment would do, or one variety would do well in the north and another variety in the south. Well, now with these predictions and being able to make predictions over, over all environments, uh, we're starting to select varieties that now do well in every year in all locations um, and i think that's really been the value for me it hasn't necessarily been the prediction accuracy per se in any one given year but it's led to higher stability of yield over multiple multiple years okay very good thank you how about how about a couple of more questions here uh, you talk about about the data processing. It's you know it's significant with this. Um, are you happy? The question is, are you happy with our programming, or have you tried other pro used other programs uh, to to uh, capture the data? Yeah, I mean us personally, we've been pretty happy with our programming. Um, you know, it's open source. There's a lot of there's a lot of resources out there that have been able to help us. Uh, find you know find new ways to analyze the data. There's new packages that are coming out, um, so it's it's worked very well for us. Um, but again, there's there's multiple options out there. Um, you you know it really just has to do with I think the data that you're analyzing, um, how big of data sets are you using, um, and and you know what might be. What might be the end goal? Uh, there might be other statistical programs that are, you know, equally useful. Uh, we find our useful just because of of the open source nature of it and being able to to uh, have resources available from other programs who've written similar code and then being able to use that in our program as well. Okay, very good. Well, I'll wrap it up. I'll ask you one more question here from from the audience. Uh, so you're using uh, aerial systems, you're using genomic selection. Uh, do you consider that your use of that routine now uh, in your breeding program and, and in the pipeline? Or do you still consider it really in the research phase and, and a lot of, uh, of proof of concept is yet to be done to, to, to get it so that it is routine? Yeah, no, we're, we're using it routine in the breeding program now. Um, yeah, we've gone through kind of the research stage, um, and now we're definitely into the full application of it. Um, so, like I say, we've been we've been collecting data since um, 2000, 
2013, I think was the first summer we used uh, some sensors out in the field. Um, we've been collecting genomic information on the entire breeding program since 2016. Um, you know, on the aerial system data since 2018. So we really have a strong data set now associated with that, that yeah, has now become, just become routine. Every year we collect the data, every year we hit the go button on the, the R programming to calculate, uh, you know, new uh, estimated breeding values and, you know, prediction uh, values with the varieties we have out in the field. So, yeah, I think it's, although we're still always learning and tweaking and, and uh, it's it's very much routine in the program now. Yeah, always always ways to improve it. Right? So, well, uh, thank you very much again, Dr. Carter, for an excellent presentation. And I'll pass things over back over to Liz to wrap things up. Thanks, Bill. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar. Um, to Dr. Carter for sharing his research, and to Dr. Skapa for moderating moderating the discussion. And we hope that you found the topic interesting and we encourage you to view the full report published in Crop Science. Um, as a reminder, the recording will be made available and sent to all attendees soon. We also encourage you to fill out a short survey after the webinar concludes and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thank you again and have a good day.